Well, welcome everyone, and thanks for this opportunity to present on standard specifications for advancing low carbon materials. I'm Larry Sutter. I'm the principal with Sutter Engineering and a professor emeritus from Michigan Technological University in Houghton, Michigan. We're going to talk about standards today, and I'm going to be primarily talk about ASTM standards. Those are the, the ones that are most prevalent in North America and the ones I'm most familiar with. Hopefully, the information presented here will be generally applicable to other standard systems as well. First, a little disclaimer. I have to predict about the future here as we start talking about where we're going to go with specifications and standards. And it is difficult to predict the future, as that famous philosopher Yogi Berra has told us. Looking at our past, there's always been many predictions that have been made and many of them have been wrong quite often we have thought things would never change but in fact they do change and and they change for the better so of course predicting the future is always a risky undertaking in the case of cement and concrete however i think the future is a little bit easier to predict first i think that we'll be using the same materials we're using now just using them differently Second, we'll be using new materials to replace some of those old materials that we're currently using. When we talk about materials, what are we talking about here? We're talking about cements, we're talking about binders for concrete, and we're also talking about replacements for Portland cement or supplementary cementitious materials. We're also going to be talking about not just the materials by themselves, but also how we're going to use those materials in new systems. And one thing we have to understand is why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this to lower the carbon impact of concrete. Concrete has one of the lowest carbon footprints of any material when you actually look at it on a, just on the individual basis of the material. But the issue is that we use so much concrete in the world on an annual basis that, that the, the multiplier is huge. Uh, in, in 2020, 4.5 billion tons was estimated that's the use. And so although we have a very small carbon footprint for the material itself, when we look at the wide use, the number, the total carbon footprint of the material becomes very significant. So we're going to be looking at new materials to try to lower the, the carbon of the individual material of the cement itself. But at the same time, we need to think about how we're going to use less cement in our concrete and deal with the fact that this multiplier is really where the issue is and we have to get the cement out of concrete which means using more supplementary cementitious materials so this is the motivation for these changes that we're talking about so what are these materials well the the existing materials or the old materials are i think familiar to everybody portland cement of course we have coal ash uh, what we used to formally call as fly ash but now it's more common to be thinking of it in terms of coal ash, which is potentially blended with bottom ash or other materials coming out of a harvested source. Slag cement comes from blast furnace slags, um, natural pozzolans, and silica fume. And these latter materials are all referred to as our supplementary cementitious materials or SCMs. We also have other materials in our concrete, obviously. We have aggregates, a major component of our concrete, and admixtures, and these play an important role in understanding how these materials all operate and how they work together. As we move forward, the new materials we're talking about are gonna be what we refer to as alternative materials, or alternative cementitious materials in the case of new cements, alternative supplementary cementitious materials in the case, in the case of new SCMs. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to start using these in different combinations. Rather than using straight Portland cement or binary mixtures, we're going to start looking at more, more complicated mixtures. And as we mix more materials together and use these, these materials in different combinations, admixtures are going to become even more critical, and new admixtures are going to need to be developed. When we talk about alternative cementitious materials, um, some examples are shown here. Generally, they fall into two categories. The first are commonly referred to as clinker-free. Some of these um, uh, materials are, uh, are made by producing clinker phases using alternative feedstocks or alternative processes or both. Some of these are completely new materials based on completely new feedstocks. 
Um, and again, all these are using alternative processes, typically re removing the calcination step, which is a major source of CO2 in the production of, of Portland cement. We have chemically derived materials, we have biologically derived materials, and again, a key point, different feedstocks, different processes. None of these are coming from the same type of process as is the case with Portland cement. Another class of alternative cementitious materials is the alkali activated materials. Uh, these are uh, typically without any Portland cement, uh, although in some cases it may have some small amounts of Portland cement, but typically no Portland cement. And there are a number of producers out there and a variety of different forms of these materials. A number of different precursor materials are used uh, and along with a number of different activator systems. So the same type of situation we have with the, the uh, clinker-free materials, we have a variety of materials, a variety of processes, no consistency to how the material is derived. Same thing can be seen when we look at our alternative supplementary cementitious materials, different feedstocks, different processes. Some are manufactured materials, some are modified natural materials. A whole range of different types of feedstocks and processes resulting in a whole different groups of materials. And then we look at new binder systems. Well, in many cases, these are taking existing materials that we are familiar with, um, such as clinker and calcine clay and limestone for that matter, and blending them together, making one that's very commonly known as LC3. There's other types of materials, new systems out there. The, the uh, high filler, low water um, blends are an emerging uh, material that it's, it's, it be, we'll be seeing more of in the future. So these are, again, new combinations of materials, not just necessarily a new individual material, but a new combination of material. So in short, it's getting complicated on the playground. We used to have a pretty simple situation, um, and we kind of had one process, we had one feedstock, we had or a very narrow range of feedstocks. Things are very well defined, and we can predict what's going to happen. As we move forward, it's going to be much different as we try to understand how to integrate all these new materials. And if we don't have specifications um, to guide us, if we don't have standards to guide us, there are going to be some growing pains. And we have to try to avoid those. We have to start looking at ways to implement these materials in a faster, more uniform approach. So this is going to involve new specifications and changes in specifications. And yes, change is needed, but as we make this change, we have to keep it focused on the right things. We need to do what every other industry does. We need to learn how to engineer our materials. This requires measuring fundamental properties known to impact performance in concrete. Current material specifications in general do not measure these fundamental properties. We may need new tests and we definitely need to use the new tests that we've already developed. We need to get away from relying solely on empirical surrogates to fundamental properties. The best example is the strength activity index test, which is used as a surrogate for reactivity. It's not a bad test per se, but it does not give us a true measure of positive reactivity. It simply demonstrates the material does no harm. We have at least three different versions of the test, depending on the material being specified, and the results cannot be compared nor do they provide us with information to guide any mixed design. In the case of coal ash, the most common use of the SCI, we have set specification limits for the tests that have been widely shown to be ineffective. It's not a fault of the test, it's a fault of the specification. As we move forward, we're going to have to adopt the use of performance-based specifications. There are simply too many materials coming at us they are too diverse in terms of the feedstock, in terms of the process used to produce those materials. We can no longer write prescriptive specifications for every single material. We need to measure and report fundamental properties that determine the performance of that material when using concrete, and then learn how to use that information to design concrete mixtures. 
Developing a performance-based specification is likely going to be less of an issue than is transitioning to using it. The user community has relied on prescription for materials in the past simply because they could. In the past, the range of properties for a given material, such as Portland cement or fly ash, was not as great as the range of properties that we'll see when comparing, for example, two alternative SEMs or two alternative cements. In the past, we would think that because two ashes were both class F, well, they were going to perform the same. This is not necessarily true. And even for a single source, the variation over time can lead to significant changes in concrete performance. Monitoring key properties such as the reactivity will aid in identifying such variances even with conventional materials. The user community will need to be trained and over time they will gain experience with material performance measures. They may need to do more trial batching than previously done, in a, but in point of fact, they probably should have been doing that before. Relying on prescription has lulled many specifiers into a false sense of security that we could simply use materials interchangeably. So as long as I have the floor, I will comment on our standards development process. In short, it is antiquated and it needs to be revamped. Our system of developing standards dates back to the early 20th century, and here I'm referring to the ASTM and ASHTO processes. It's worth noting that some people still refer to our ballots as letter ballots because that's how we used to send them out, through the mail, and that's how we send them back, through the mail. Of course, as we move forward and think about new ways to do this, we need to maintain consensus in our process, and of course our committees need to remain balanced. These are very important, and ASTM adheres strongly to these principles. But modern communication permits a much more rapid turnaround of ballots and a much more frequent ballot cycle. Unfortunately, we are mired in this old approach of one ballot or two ballots uh, every six months, have a meeting, and then repeat. A lot of this is dependent upon the organization, ASTM, ASHTO, whichever organization, how they structure themselves. Uh, the volunteers, in many cases, I think have the energy and the desire to move this faster, but the machinery for processing these material, these, this information and developing the standards is, is still mired in the past. So we really need to spend time to really understand how we can move this forward, how we can change these processes to move specification development forward faster. So now I want to give you just a quick overview of some things that are going on at ASTM relative to performance specifications and new specifications for materials. I want to talk about the performance specification for SEMs that we're developing, a performance specification for alkali activated cements, and then also touch briefly on changes to the blended cement specification to accommodate some of these new binder systems. At ASTM, we are currently developing a new performance-based specification for SEMs. And I mentioned earlier about speeding up the process of developing standards, specifications, test methods at ASTM. This is a poster child for that issue. We have, so far, spent about 10 years developing this specification. That simply was taking too long to get this done. The specification is intended to be a pathway for emerging materials to be specified, but also a way to uh, specify off-spec materials, uh, off-spec conventional materials. It's going to incorporate the recently developed um, R3 test for measuring reactivity, as well as going to incorporate the foam index test, which has recently been standardized. Both of these tests were adopted in 2020, um, C1897 is the R3 test, and C1827 is the foam index test. This slide shows 
basically the heart of this specification. Of course, there's more details to it other than this, but this is really kind of the crux of the matter. You can see here we have the reactivity test, procedure A and procedure B, the R3 tests, and we specify limits for that. We'll talk a little bit more in a moment about those limits. So that is one factor that where we have set limits within this performance spec that need to be met. We've also included the strength activity index test. Uh, very briefly, this test involves making a control cube uh, with Portland cement only, and then making a test cube where you remove 20% of the Portland cement and replace it with a test material. In the case of the current specification for coal ash, the limit that's set for that test is 75. So we're removing 20% of the material and looking for 75% of the same strength. What we decided here after much discussion was to set that limit at 80. That's the first change. And then the second change is we've provided two different options for the strength activity index test. Option one is that you must meet it at 7 and 28 days. Option two is you meet it at 56 days. The second option is provided primarily to accommodate slowly reacting materials. As seen here, we also have the foam index test included. This is an optional test. We're recognizing that air entrainment is not necessarily an issue in all cases, so the foam index is a report only and it's an optional test. And I also highlighted this section of the standard, which was something we spent quite a bit of time talking about, and that was, what if this standard is used to uh, specify a, an existing material? And uh, the concern was that if the existing material did not meet its existing specification, the specifier would not know that, and they would like to see that information conveyed to the specifier. So what we have added in this in this specification is that if the material is meets the scope of an existing specification, so for example it's a silica fume, let's say, uh, but it doesn't meet the silica fume specification, the producer is required to not only run all the tests that are required in this specification, but to also run all the tests that are required in the silica fume specification and report the results of both. And in the case of the silica fume specification, for one example I'm using, uh, specify what the material did not meet. So basically point out why, whatever the material is, point out why it's not being specified under its existing specification. Regarding the limits for the R3 test, uh, we relied on the research that's been published and we selected a probability value of 66%. And this was after much discussion within the committee. Uh, we went uh, around a number of different values and of course, the trade-off is between um, specifying a higher uh, probability, but in that, and by doing so, potentially rejecting slowly reacting materials, um, or obviously going to a lower probability and run the risk of uh, accepting an inert material. So after much discussion and looking at other research that was brought to the committee, it was determined that this is probably the best compromise in terms of, of establishing a threshold for the minimum level reactivity we want to see from a SCM. As mentioned previously, there's going to be challenges with implementing performance-based specifications. The specification for SCMs does not place any limits on chemical composition. And there's a perceived risk of not requiring a specific chemical composition simply because historically that's what we've done, particularly with fly ash. From the specifier's perspective, there may be concerns of consistency. And there's a false sense of comfort that comes from, from knowing the chemistry because there's a, a, a sense that they're controlling what they get and not understanding that there's other 
things that affect how that material performs rather than simply the composition of the material. In general, as we move forward, a specifier is going to need more knowledge about materials, and that's just a simple fact. They're going to need to understand things such as reactivity, uh, sulfate content, LOI, foam index. They're going to have to have more reliance on trial batching. And if they don't do that in-house, there may be some increased cost of testing. And some of the testing that's going to be performed may fall into the category of more skilled testing, such as the R3 tests. So all these things together are going to lead to the, the specifier being resistant to moving towards the specification. But if we can demonstrate consistency and we can demonstrate performance, I believe that in time that will win the day and these types of specifications will become preferred. The onus then will be on the producer to produce a more consistent product. If the product is not consistent and we are having issues with how we specify and how we measure that product, we have a recipe for disaster. So consistency is going to have to be something that we strive for as we move towards producing these new materials. The second new specification I want to talk briefly about is a specification for alkali activated cements. This specification is going to be largely based on ASTM C1157. If you're not familiar with it, um, C1157 is the performance-based specification for hydraulic cements. It's been around now for about 35 years. This new specification for alkali activated cements will be based on that. But of course we have to make some changes in terms of how we test the material and so we're going to be turning to another new document that's been developed at ASTM, C928, which is a test method for compressive strength of alkali activated cement cubes. In this new specification we're going to define two basic or two general types of alkali activated cementitious materials and that's going to be based on the curing process that is required. Materials that are cured at a standard laboratory temperature, you know, for example, 20 degrees C, those are going to be what we call the type AACM, RTC. Materials that require elevated temperature curing, in this case 60 degrees C is used in the test, type AACM, ETC. Each of these types can have further designation as either general use, high early strength, moderate sulfate resistance, high sulfate resistance, moderate heat of hydration, or low heat of hydration. The physical requirements for this material will be very similar to the ASTM C1157 requirements. The differences really fall into how we test the material, how we cure the material for testing. Another activity underway is to uh, make some changes in ASTM C595. ASTM C595 is a specification for blended hydraulic cement, and we want to add to it a new type called Type 1C. The current proposal is for Type 1C to have a minimum clinker or Portland cement content of 30%. Beyond that, any of the existing materials used in blended products can be used in any quantity or any combination. So this would include limestone, pozzolan, such as coal ash, natural pozzolan, silica fume, and slag cement. Of course, the final blend must meet all applicable requirements of the specifications, so this by itself may limit the extent to which some materials may be blended. However, in general, it's going to provide direct support for implementing some of these new blends that are going to be coming, such as the LC3 blends and the high filler, low water blends. It should be noted that ASTM C595 is harmonized with AASHTO M240. And what this means is, as we get this developed and adopted into 595, it will also be adopted into M240. And this is very important because in the U.S., Getting the DOTs to adopt the material is very important to getting the material implemented broadly. And by having it in the actual specification book as well as the ASTM specification book, 
What that means is it will be accessible to every DOT in the United States. So this is a very important step towards implementation. As we move into the future, we're going to be using existing materials, but we're going to be using them in new ways. At the same time, we're going to be incorporating new materials into our concrete. And all this is going to require specification development and, in many cases, new specifications. By necessity, these new specifications are going to have to be performance-based. We simply do not have the capability of developing prescriptive specifications for every new material that's going to be developed. We need new specifications for alternative cements. We need specifications for alternative SEMs. And as well, we need new specifications for some of the novel blends that are under development or being produced currently. Last, our industry really needs to develop new approaches to standards development. We need to accelerate that process. We need to, of course, still um, maintain consensus in the process, and we need to maintain balance in the committees that are writing those standards. But we need to implement procedures and, and processes to allow this to move forward faster. Thank you for your time. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions.